Hello, Satish. It's so nice to see you after quite a long time and to see you looking so well. I really appreciate you joining us today. I know how busy you've been and you couldn't join the program live, but it's delight to have the chance to have a conversation with you in advance of our World Localization Day program. It is my pleasure to be with you and have conversation with you about all the things which we are so deeply concerned. And you know, I was just trying to think the other day how long ago it is that I met you. And I know that it was with Jim George. You remember the Canadian ambassador who was involved yes. with all these issues? Yes. So yes. I'm, it was in the 70s, probably in about 78. Yes. So we've known each other for a very long time. Very long time. We had been good friends, lifelong friendship. Yes, really. And as I've so often said, you've been one of the leading spiritual teachers because your spiritual teachings have included a holistic approach, always a holistic approach. And your language of, for instance, talking about soil, soul, and society, of course, completely resonates with everything that we're trying to do. And I'd love you to say a little bit more about how and where, why you came up with that lovely trilogy of words, soil, soul, and society. Yes, you know, lots of great movements express their uh, vision and their values in succinct three words. Like uh, French Revolution was represented by egalité, liberty, fraternity. Uh, in the same way, the Greek philosophers uh, talked about uh, truth, goodness, and beauty. So I was thinking that what will be a new trinity for our time? What will be a new trinity which represents the holistic, ecological, uh, local, spiritual movement? And therefore, I thought of this uh, new trinity, soil, because we are connected with nature. We are nature. There's no separation between humans and nature. So soil is the primary source of life. Uh, people in the world have turned soil and nature as a resource for profit, resource for money, resource for economy. I say the soil and nature are source of life itself. And then I said that lots of our uh, environmental movement only focus on the outer and not the inner the spiritual dimension, uh, the psychological dimension, uh, the dimension of consciousness. So I wanted to bring that dimension into our movement. And this is why I put soul in the middle, which is the kind of inner reality. And then, of course, we are part of human community. How we can create a, a, a society in which everybody can live in harmony with each other and without conflicts, without wars, without poverty, and have a, a prosperous, happy, joyful, but simple and elegant and, and ecologically sustainable and regenerative society. So this is why I put soil, soul, society as a new trinity for our time to represent the holistic worldview. And for me, this, of course, is also basically the same thinking as behind community, ecology and spirituality. And yes. Again, yes. it's the it's the absolutely you know essential message that we need to be looking at what's happening to the well-being of human beings, the well-being of the earth, and how a deep spiritual connectedness between people and between people and nature is fundamental for our well-being and the well-being of the planet. Absolutely, they are totally interconnected. And our well-being and well-being of the planet are connected because we are made of each other. We are made of earth, air, fire, water. And then, of course, we are also made of consciousness and, and, and also time and space. So in the Indian tradition, in Jain tradition, we have seven elements which inform the entire existence. Uh, earth, air, fire, water, these are the four 
uh, kind of um, physical or material um, elements, and then time, space, and consciousness. Chit, what we call chit in Sanskrit. Uh, these are the seven elements. So we are all a community made of these seven elements. So your idea of community is absolutely fundamental. So we say the whole earth is a community. The whole earth is our home and the whole cosmos is our country. And nature is our, our family. Because the birds in the sky, the, ele uh, the, the elephants and, and the tigers and snakes um, and the insects and the worms in nature are our family members. And love to all living beings and, and reverence for life is our religion. So for me, that uh, your idea of community is a very beautiful word. And if we can have the sense of community, of human community and the earth community, then we can live in harmony with the world. And what I so appreciate with you, Satish, is that because of your reading and understanding of Gandhi, you have completely understood why decentralization or localization is so important for, for us to actually feel and experience ourselves as a part of life. We need to live at that more human scale and that deep connectedness that came about as we lived in smaller human scale communities. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, in order to be spiritual and in order to form a community, you need to know your place. You need to know your uh, members of your community. You need to know what they are doing. So, um, so local and human scale and small is beautiful is an essential ingredient of, um, of community and an essential ingredient of our humanity, I would say, and spirituality. So knowing your place, being rooted in your place, although your consciousness, your mind can be global, you can have a global thinking and you can love whole humanity. As I said, whole cosmos is our country. Whole earth is our, our home and nature is our family and love is our religion. That is a consciousness and big mind and big heart is there. But our body is limited. We have a, a five foot six or six foot body and we have a two feet and we have to be rooted in our community, in our land, in our village, in our locality. And therefore, having that sense of belonging to a place and knowing your community members and who are people who are growing your food, knowing people who are making your clothes, knowing people who are making your furniture, knowing people who are building your house. So that, so all these things are as essential uh, ingredients for making community. If you don't know your people, you don't need your people, you don't need them to grow your food, you don't need them to make your house, you don't need them to make your clothes, you don't need them to make your furniture, then there's no community. So in order to have community, and then also spirituality, you need to be rooted and, and, and a kind of, you have to have a base uh, in the place. Uh, so, so what Mahatma Gandhi calls Swadeshi, meaning economics of the place, wherever you are, you need to uh, derive your, um, your resources for life from your community. But your mind can be as big and broad and, and inclusive as possible, but your body has to be rooted in a place. That is the idea of Mahatma Gandhi. But you know, it's also interesting, Satish, I think that very often Westerners think that their mind can encompass the whole earth and they think they know what's going on in China or in Iran or in Israel. But actually part of, of this awakening, I think, is to realize our limitations and our, to be much, much more humble uh, and not claim to know everything in the universe. So to me, there is a big difference between the expansiveness that comes with a spiritual sense of connectedness to Mother Gaia and to the you know to life all around us how we can feel so expanded and and large and yet at the same time in terms of our mind we have to be very aware of how limited our understanding are of faraway places 
Absolutely, I totally agree with you. Uh, there is a big uh, difference between consciousness and knowledge and information. In our consciousness is our love and our interconnectedness, our interdependence, and our what Thich Nhat Hanh calls our interbeing. We are all interconnected. We are made of the sunshine. We are made of the rain. We are made of the forest. We are um, we are interconnected. So that is a more a sphere of consciousness, where our love for whole humanity is there. But then what you said, and I agree with you, that this knowledge and information about politics and economics and and this and that uh, that is we don't need it all because a lot of our knowledge and our information uh, we miss which is local and we don't know our neighbor we don't know our community and we know everything what is going on in america or or in israel or in india or china so that is not uh, what i'm talking about the the universal uh, compassionate mind but the buddha and jesus christ and and mahatma gandhi and mother teresa and you and and many many other great leaders have taught us that we have to love in our heart consciousness is big but our knowledge and information has to be we need to know your neighbor and if you, how are you going to love your neighbor if you don't know your neighbor but we don't know our neighbor we don't but we know all about uh, joe biden and we know all about xi jinping and modi and all the world leaders but we don't know our neighbor so know your neighbor so you can love your neighbor so i agree with you totally that we don't have to have all this explosion of information and knowledge about politics and economics and 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 all those things of the world but what we need to have is love in our heart that is a consciousness chit a chitta uh, so that we love all living beings and we celebrate the diversity of cultures and diversity of religions and diversity of languages and diversity of natural um, uh, existence so we celebrate the diversity and and we love the diversity but we keep ourselves rooted in the place we, where we live and you know i also um with my many experience you know long experience in ladakh what i found was that in the ancient tibetan language people couldn't express themselves the way we do in modern english they couldn't say i know that it is like this in china or i know what joe biden is like in their language when they talked about something they hadn't experienced they had to say it is said that yeah one hears that but yeah. never with the certitude of it is like this in china or yeah. india where you've never been so you have yeah. in the language the humility of expressing with greater certitude things you actually experience but whenever you're talking about things you haven't experienced the language won't let you pretend that you have that knowledge i agree i agree thanks to you helena that i also went to ladakh and thanks to you that i met some of your friends um from the local community and what the, what they have which we lack in our modern world is the depth they have a depth of knowledge they have a depth of wisdom they have a depth of interconnectedness where our knowledge has lacks that depth our knowledge is much more sort of spread wide but no depth no wisdom no understanding we have a knowledge we have information but no understanding but the people i met in ladakh and also in other indigenous cultures they have that depth of understanding uh, they may have a lack of information but the the wisdom they have and and the, they they say at the indigenous cultures they say father sky mother earth um all the the, the four legged or the two winged um, um, um animals and birds are our family members so their their consciousness is similar to what i'm talking about the indian traditional culture of this inclusive mind interconnected interdependent inclusive mind but at the same time deeper knowledge and deeper understanding of the place where you are and your fauna and flora and animals and soil and the people where you live a deeper knowledge and that is what i found in ladakh when i visited thanks to your organization well 
I also want our audience to hear how much you have contributed to bringing this wisdom, especially to England, and that you've understood this sort of paradox between the expansive consciousness and the expansiveness of love, and yet the importance of small scale. So you, yeah. more than anyone, has brought Schumacher to England, you know, with the Schumacher Society and the Schumacher College, and also, very importantly, the small school. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about Schumacher and the importance of small scale. Yes. Uh, E.F. Schumacher was very influenced by um, Mahatma Gandhi. He was also very influenced by Buddhism. He was one of the first and perhaps the only Western economist to talk about Buddhist economics. He put those two words together and people asked him, Mr. Schumacher, what economics has to do with Buddhism or with spiritual values? And Schumacher used to say that uh, economics without spirituality and without values is like soil without water. Mm. It goes dry. And therefore, uh, we need to bring spiritual values into economics. And, and then he says spirituality cannot be if it is impersonal. You have to bring human contact and human scale. And this is why he wrote the most beautiful book uh, called Small is Beautiful. And it's also a beautiful book. So Buddhist economics, small is beautiful, human scale are necessary in order to know your place. And therefore, uh, uh, therefore, I wanted to continue that uh, thinking of uh, our ancestors like Mahatma Gandhi and E.F. Schumacher. And so I established the small school at Schumacher College. And I invited you to give a Schumacher lecture. And I, you have been teaching at uh, Schumacher College. So what we are doing at Schumacher College is to connecting with the soil, with the land, with our local community. And we have seven acres of land and we grow our vegetables and we train young people to learn about gardening and growing food and cooking. And so we get um, students uh, who come to stay at Schumacher College for six months to one year. And they particularly have a special course in gardening. But all our students, whether they are learning holistic education or holistic science or holistic economics, they all live like a community and they work together, they cook together, they garden together, they clean together, they go walking on Dartmoor or near the sea together. And so this idea of living in a community and do you know, Helena, when people, our young people go to universities or colleges or schools, the teacher look at the student and they think that the student has no body. They have no heart, they have no hands, they have no legs, they have no body. They only have brain, and even not the whole brain, only the left hemisphere of the brain. And so they only teach their left hemisphere of uh, kind of scientific, rational, um, analytical uh, thinking. Well, at Schumacher College, we are saying that you students have a whole body. You are a whole person. You have a head, you have a heart, you have hands. So we would like to have education of head, education of heart, and education of hands, so that you learn to also love and compassion and kindness and relationship and respect for each other. And you learn to grow food, cook food, um, clean houses. And you also use your uh, legs to walk on that more or deep time walk with uh, Stefan Harding. And so this way, head, heart, and hands in a small scale, human scale, local community, and we connect with Dartington, we connect with Totnes, we connect with all our local people. So, so this so Gandhian, Schumacherian, holistic, ecological, local, human scale, these are the fundamental principles uh, of Schumacher College. And I would like to see that all our universities, all our colleges, all our schools are transformed in this way. And they should be small, they should be human scale. And every uh, school and university and college should have a farm, should have a garden. They should learn to grow food. They should learn handicrafts because growing food and making things with your hands 
is not only useful as an economy, but it's also a spiritual practice. I teach a course at Schumacher College called Gardening as a Spiritual Practice. I would say when you are growing food, you are one with nature. You have a poetry, you have um, stories, you have kind of imagination uh, when you are using your hands, touching the soil and it's kind of connecting with nature and mother earth and you feel unity with nature, oneness with nature. That you cannot do just reading books and computer um, knowledge and, and the kind of screens and so on. That is very limited knowledge. Our education has become so limited and so narrow and we have lost all that kind of dimensions. So I'm, I am hoping that this Shivaka College will become an example and, and a model for universities of the world because the universities in the world today are out of date. They are teaching education uh, which were designed for uh, 19th and 20th century uh, when the economy was prevalent, industry, industrialization was um, uh, vogue, vogue and, and uh, fashionable. But now we are living in a new age, a new era, an age of ecology, age of environment. We have a climate change. We have polluted oceans. We have polluted uh, soil. Our animals are suffering. We are in a new age. And so we need to teach our young people a more holistic, more local, more spiritual, uh, more soil-based uh, and, and more hand-based. So it's, it's a, for spiritual as well as for economic reasons, I want this Schumacher College example to um, you know, spread around the world and all universities should be transformed because the education we are giving is not only out of date, but it's a dangerous. We are making young people, um, training them for the industrial age, but when they go tomorrow, uh, next um, decade, this age is not going to be very helpful. So we need new education. And this is what Schumacher College is doing. Well, absolutely. And I think Schumacher has been a beacon of real sanity and genuinely holistic knowledge uh, for now for decades. And as you know, for a long, long time, I've been warning about how the globalizing economy has been pushing us in the direction of mass urbanization. And that mass urbanization has been linked to using more and more energy for mega technological systems, replacing people, pushing them off the land, pushing them away from precisely those broad skills that Schumacher and, and the small school were teaching that we are whole human beings. We can use our hands, we can be creative. We need to use our entire brain linked to our heart, linked to our senses, embodied and whole based intelligence to be genuinely creative. And I, I call this also this shift now towards waking up for the need for human scale, for scaling down and slowing down. It's also about slowing down. This is what I call an ancient futures trend because in the ancient indigenous culture of Ladakh, I saw how much healthier and happier people were when they did develop all those skills, when they were whole human beings who were able to use their bodies, their hands, and always in Tibetan Buddhism, they talked about the danger of only heart without wisdom and the danger of wisdom without heart. We need both together. And that's how people lived in their training of children. They grew up in intergenerational community instead of segregated into separate age groups. And of course, this segregation into separate age groups was part of the industrial model, as you were saying, that is now completely outdated. All around the world, people are actually gaining respect for indigenous culture. There's such a clear desire to have a better relationship with nature. You see it, you know, eco-psychology, eco-theology, eco-linguistics, everything. But unfortunately, our governments are still pushing this urbanizing, high-tech, very energy-intensive path. So I think we need not, as you say, we need Schumacher colleges all over the world and we need to get this word out, what we're talking about here now and 
your wisdom and the wisdom of many other people on our World Localization Day program needs to be disseminated. And I guess you've seen how we're up against a mainstream media that doesn't help us. And we also <coughs> see how the social media doesn't help us. What kind of ideas have you got for helping us to get this, not just the vision out, but the example of Schumacher College? I mean, you talked about uh, the government and social media and, and other media. They are all talking about climate change, but they still want the old fashioned global economic development. They just want to have a technology to solve their problems. Only technological solution. But I'm saying that if you have global economy, then you have to build all the infrastructure, railways, seaports, airports, um, highways, motorways, um, more cars, more trains. You have to take all that material and you have to mining and you have to extract material from nature. It's, it's, we are living on a finite world and you cannot have this infinite growth um, and building of uh, sh ship um, uh, kind of ports, seaports, airports, uh, infrastructure. So all that is going to cost energy and they're all going to cost material. So we need to go local and we don't need so many airports and so many seaports and so many motorways and highways and trains and cars. We need to have, I walk around the world on my two feet. Uh, so we can go anywhere. I, people should go, be able to walk to work. And so if we really want, they re seriously, if they are, the world is interested in addressing the problem of climate change and global warming, the solution is go local and go slow and go small. This is why I have written a book called Elegant Simplicity. We have to live locally, but also simple life. We don't have to have so much um, uh, material possessions and so many um, things in our house and in our offices. We can live with fewer things, but better quality. I always want people to have things which are beautiful, useful, and durable. I call it my uh, BUD principle, B-U-D. Beautiful, useful, durable. So if we have fewer things, but they last longer, they are more beautiful and enjoyable, then we can live a better life and have a time for non-material things. Time for dancing, time for singing, time for music, time for poetry, time for walking in nature, time for family, time for friends. If we are working, 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 producing more and more goods and globalizing the economy. We have no time for other fine things. You talked about Ladakh. They dance. They sing. Uh, they, they have beautiful things, handmade beautiful things. So beauty and, and a usefulness and durability is inbuilt in the culture of Ladakh and many indigenous cultures. So global warming and climate change solution will not going to happen unless we go local and we go small. It's wonderful you say that, Satish. You know, many people, particularly I would say on the left, were very, very skeptical about localization for a long time. They thought that it was some kind of privileged, white, Western thing of just looking after yourself, not caring about other people. They didn't realize that actually, if we were to suddenly be reliant on our local economy, it's actually these white Westerners who would be worse off than anybody else. You know, if the Indian villages were suddenly told to survive off the local economy, they would be far better off than we are. But we're yeah, all being damaged. Why don't you say um, something about that? Yeah. No, I, I would say you're absolutely right. This urbanization and, and it's, 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 it's so many, too many big cities. Mumbai now has got something like 50 million people. Um, uh, uh, New Delhi has got something like 20 million. Beijing, Tokyo, um, uh, Mexico City, all these big cities, they are um, not very ecological. They are very energy intensive. Therefore, I would say, Schumacher talked about it, the city should be smaller, no more than a sort of a million or, or, or half a million, a million people at the most. Edinburgh, for example, is a beautiful city, 
had only half a million people. Uh, Bristol is a lovely city where you live. There are only about half a million or a million people. So we need to have small cities so that everybody is able to walk to work, to library, to school, uh, to your doctor, wherever you want to go, you should be able to walk. And, and cities, should be, cities should be designed with ecology in mind, nature in mind. At the moment, our cities have sent nature into exile. All the nature is out and only building, 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 roads and cars and, and shopping malls and, 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 and parking places, all that. So I think we need to redesign our cities, bring back nature into it, bring back uh, humanity and a local culture and arts and crafts and all those things have to be part of city. So I want a new design for the city. And you know, these cities are only last 100 to 200 years old. They are not very old. And therefore what humans have done and made, humans can also change. So I'm an optimist. I think that um, uh, you are a pioneer of local economy. Schumacher was pioneer, Mahatma Gandhi was pioneer. And I think their time is not gone. The time is coming. The ecology, the climate change, the global warming, the pollution of our environment, ocean, soil, all those are such pressing problems, particularly at this moment, the COVID-19 is an example that what we have done to nature and our relationship with the natural world is not healthy. And so we have to learn from this COVID crisis. And post-COVID, we cannot go back to business as usual. We have to have a new economy, a new way of life, which is more local, more ecological, more spiritual, more, more rooted in, na uh, in nature and in soil. If we have that kind of vision, then I think I'm hopeful that there is a new generation coming, that new consciousness is coming. I don't know if you, if you heard her giving a recital of poetry. At the inauguration of Joe Biden, there was a beautiful black poet called Amanda Gorman. She read absolutely wonderful poem. And I think if she is representing the young people and young generation, a black poet, woman, young, speaking great wisdom, spirituality, ecology, nature, everything in that poem. And so I think that if that is the new generation coming, we will have a new economics, we have a new kind of urban uh, living, we can have a new relations with nature and and the world will be a better place. Well, I'm absolutely sure that young people and old people today long for that more connected life. People who have been pushed off into the big cities, into the high rise living, amazingly crowded together with other people. They're actually cut off from other people. So people are more lonely in the big cities as well as cut off from nature, from the plants from the animals, even seeing the sky. So there is a longing to come back home to nature. But I think our biggest task today is to be aware that so much of the language, even in the Green New Deal, so much is still behind the scenes, pushing urbanization. The whole agenda that's being set, even with the help of the UN and many well-intentioned people, is this new um, AI-controlled megacity which now they are talking about being localized. They're talking about us being able to walk to everything we need in the city. But of course, it's going to be a corporate run, technology run city. So it will be uniform. We'll have McDonald's on every corner. They won't have the authenticity of the living food that comes from real farms in the region around the city where smaller restaurants will have their own identity, their own authenticity, where creative people are able to practice their diverse ways of doing things. So we have to be really careful now to see through some of the language, to actually look at what are we talking about here? Where is the money going? What kind of infrastructure? How is it that we're still measuring growth by GDP? We've just got to insist that there is a wake up. So the thing that is that, actually, the, yeah. The thing is that uh, uh, 
technology, E.F. Schumacher used the term appropriate technology. Technology should not become the master. Technology should be only a servant of wisdom and human beings. And and greatest technology nature has given us is our hands. And we should be able to use our hands. This gift of hands, the miracle, what these hands can do, we can take an ordinary piece of clay and transform it into a beautiful pot, like Bernard Leach or Hamada's pots. Um, we can take ordinary piece of wood and we can turn it into a beautiful sculpture or beautiful furniture. These hands are the greatest technology and we are not using them. And, and this idea that technology will solve all the problem is a kind of madness. And I would say that technology can only go so far. In the end, we have to have a human imagination, human creativity, our hands. And when we are able to uh, use technology in a wise way, appropriate technology, small scale technology, and human wisdom and human heart still in charge, and human hands still in charge, then I think technology has a solution. But uh, jobs are not going to be provided by technology. Nature is the provider of jobs. Yes. When you plant trees, and you harvest apples, and you make juice, that is a proper job. When you plant um, uh, trees and harvest cotton and turn that cotton into um, clothes. Nature is the provider of jobs. Technology does not provide jobs. Nature is our greatest um, greatest provider of jobs. But nature is more than a uh, provider of jobs. Nature is a provider of happiness and, and joy. And therefore, this dependence, over-dependence on technology and thinking that technology will solve all the problems it's complete madness, complete madness, in my view. We have to think about how we um, use our body technology, hand technology, in such a way that we can make beautiful things, but at the same time, not just make, 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 but also enjoy and also celebrate. We are missing celebration. Our technologically engaged people working from day and night, driving lorries, driving uh, aeroplanes, um, working in factories, working in offices, in front of a computer, no time to celebrate, no time for your children, no time for your family and friends, no time for poetry and dancing and singing, no time for cooking, no time for gardening. What kind of life are we creating on depending on technology, technology, technology? So technology has a place but we must put it in its place and not exactly. allow it to dominate our lives. Fundamental to what we're talking about is moving in a direction towards the localizing path, the slowing down, using technology to serve people's needs. That is a path that is also going to reduce that huge gap between rich and poor. And I think I wonder if you have advice about what would be the key policies that you would encourage people to look at if they wanted to see policy change to bring yeah. about the sort of future we want. You know, uh, the real change does not come from the top. Real change does not come from the center. Mahatma Gandhi did not work from the House of Parliament or President's House. Martin Luther King did not come from the White House. And, and, uh, and, uh, and all the great revolutions, the Buddha had to leave his palace in order to create a new thinking. Uh, Jesus Christ had to be in a little, little shepherd's child uh, from a little village. So the real revolution will not come from the top. So we should not think about uh, White House and G7 at the moment in, in England, um, in Cornwall happening. But G7 is not going to produce an ecological worldview. And, and a Modi and, and a Xi Jinping and Biden and Boris, uh, Boris Johnson and all these are not going to come up with a, a new worldview, which is holistic, spiritual, ecological, small scale, human scale. These values have to come from bottom up, from the grassroots level. And so you are doing wonderful work in creating that grassroots awareness. And the, we need millions and millions of people around the world producing good food, making good crafts, making local economy in Africa, in India, in China, in South America, in North America, in Europe, in Australia, everywhere, 
we have to get people's movement going. And when people's movement is strong and vibrant and vital, then policymakers will change policy to respond to that. But government and leaders are not going to be the leaders of a new worldview or a new ecological paradigm or a new local and small scale, human scale paradigm. It has to be led by the ordinary people. And you are a great example of a leader coming from the grassroots. You have not Absolutely. come from, from the center. Yeah. You are coming yeah. from the bottom up. And so Bandana Shiva is like that. And, and, uh, and, uh, 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 and many, many people you are gathering in your conference, um, in, in, your, uh, um, in this local economy conference, they are all grassroots people. So we have to focus on building grassroots movement stronger and stronger and stronger. And that is the future for the local economy and human scale paradigm. See, this is what we're trying to do with World Localization Day is to gather and make visible all of these bottom-up movements. And what's very interesting is to see that what they share is that they come from the bottom up and that they represent human scale initiatives. And that's why they are inspiring and, and really healthy and real concrete examples of how we can actually reduce our ecological footprint, while we increase the number of jobs, while we increase productivity on the land. This is the amazing thing about the local food movement. We are showing that when you have small diversified farms, they can produce far more per acre of land than any exactly. monoculture ever can. So we're actually demonstrating that it's possible. And we have to now talk among ourselves about what the policies are that are destroying us and imposing monoculture, imposing faster and faster speed, destroying jobs by the millions, by driving people off the land. And so we're beginning to gather, you know, now on, on the program this week, we've got people from 30 countries, from six continents, all demonstrating in this holistic way, the multiple benefits, the productivity, the health of ecosystems completely linked to the health of our bodies, of course, but also the health of human beings as they come together in community. This is vital, as you know, for our sense of identity, for our sense I, of meaning. I agree with you. And I want to congratulate you for organizing this because you are a pioneer and you are a leader, and you have given your whole life dedicated to this kind of new paradigm, a new worldview, a new vision, which is a human, spiritual, local, so human scale, and communitarian. And this is the way forward. So I would uh, support that, encourage that. And what everybody has to do, there are three things. First and foremost, we have to be the change that we want to see in the world. Mahatma Gandhi said that. It's no good telling other people what to do. We have to show that it is possible. We have to live it like a radiator radiates heat. We all, each and every one of us who are working at the grassroots level, the activists, we have to be the radiators of change. We have to be the radiators of transformation, the radiators of local economy and a, and a human scale uh, organization. So be the change that you want to see in the world. Number one, don't Think about the world first. Think about, start with yourself. The, the journey of a thousand miles begins with yourself, with your first step in the right direction. Number two, we, our activists have to learn to communicate this change through poetry, through music, through songs like John Byers, like John Lennon, like Picasso made a great painting of Guernica. That was the message of peace. With that one painting, he made the statement how a horrible war is. So all of us through painting, music, um, gardening, cooking, whatever you want to do, communicate your change to the world and show them that it's possible. Examples are more important and speak louder than the words. And so uh, communicate that change through your action. The third thing I would like our young people and all people, activists, um, wherever they are, join the movement. Don't just sit and criticize. Don't just sit and be judgmental. Don't just sit and, 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 and a kind of look around. Be the part of the movement. 
join the local economy movement, join the peace movement, join the, um, uh, the um, organic gardening movement or organic farming movement, whichever appeals to you, uh, the Soil Association, Schumacher College, uh, your local futures, many, many good organizations are working in the field. Vandana Shiva's work in Navdanya. And there are many others in the United States and in Europe uh, and in Africa. There are many, many wonderful uh, things are happening. Join them, support them, be part of the movement. So be the change, communicate the change, and organize the change. And that's how the revolutions begin. Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Baklav Havel, all the great people who brought about big changes, they started from the grassroots level and then grew uh, big. So that's the way we have to move. It's again, you were so wonderful at always having these three, three words. So always I remember, so soil, soil and society, head, heart and hands, and now be the change, communicate the change, and organize the change. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, thank you. I would like to end this interview with another trinity. Another trinity is the movement needs three things at the same time. Number one, we have to protest. We have to say no to what is going wrong. Big mega developments, mega organizations, mega cities, um, pollution, uh, waste. We have to say no, no, no. We cannot go with it. Protest. But that is not enough. Protest is too negative. We also need to do something more. Second word is protect. Protest and protect. There are wonderful things in the world today. Small scale farmers, family farmers, indigenous cultures, beauty, arts, crafts, handicrafts, many, many wonderful communities like Ladakh, like um, in small villages in India, small villages in Africa, protect them. Don't allow this mega culture to come and destroy them. Be the shield to protect the, uh, the traditional cultures, uh, the wisdom and the beauty which we have inherited from our ancestors, from our cultures, ancient traditions, and so on. So protest and protect. Also not enough. We need third things. Build. Build new alternatives, like Schumacher College, like uh, permaculture, like organic farming, like biodynamic farming, uh, like small school, like Schumacher College. Many, many new alternatives we have to create because traditions cannot stop uh, and, and we just can, cannot just uh, remain in the glory of our past. We have to be part of that transformation and change by creating new initiatives. So my third word is build. So protest, protect and build. And do it all with love. Do it all with love. No hatred. No any. Uh, celebrate and do it with joyfully. Do it with spirituality. Do it with love. Love is the foundation of protest, protect, and build. This is my new trinity. I love it, Satish. And it's so close, except I don't come up with trinities. I'm always more long winded. So the five words that I've come up with is the first word is connect. Because that yeah. is about changing the I to a we, to connect with others and to connect with all of life. That's what can give us greater strength. And then we say, rethink, because we need to take a deep breath and really in a very clear, holistic way, understand the root causes of problem so that we address our action towards real systemic root causes so that our solutions can have systemic benefits, can have multiple benefits. So then we say connect, rethink, and then, like you say, we need to protest. We say resist, resist and renew. And renew. the resistance is the saying no to the mega developments, whether they come into a traditional culture or they come into Cornwall, where you live. Resist yeah. those destructive, inhuman, anti-ecological development, and then renew the life-based. What happens when we come back home to our home in nature and community? Renew that wherever you can. And then the final word we have is celebrate. So celebrate. connect, 
rethink, resist, renew, and celebrate. And Wonderful. as you say, it's always with love. All, yes, all, all of it with love. The resistance yeah. also with love. Yeah. No, yeah. no hatred, no anger. It doesn't help us. It doesn't help. And yeah. 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 Absolutely. We are in the service. And when we are in the service of humanity, in the service of future generations, in the service of planet Earth, then it's all, service can only be done with love. And, and we have no arrogance. We don't say that we are better than you or I know better than you, holier than thou. We don't have such arrogance. We, in humility, we service our humanity. Like That was Mahatma Gandhi. He was uh, doing everything with love, independence movement, local economy movement, handicraft movement, you know, love of uh, uh, untouchables and caste system. He uh, uh, resisted and uh, upliftment of women. All the things he did with love as a sense of service. So I think your five words are beautiful. I like them. And, and it has been a wonderful to speak with you, Helena. And, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to engage in this um, lively conversation. And I think you and I are sort of on the same path. We are kind of companions uh, on this journey of transformation and a journey of uh, human scale, spiritual, local, um, small uh, and beautiful with celebration and with love. I think we are all on the same page. Thank you yeah. very much for inviting me. Thank you, Satish, and thanks so, so much for all that you have done to actually demonstrate these ideas, the institutions you've built, and thank you so much for staying so young and healthy. Pray to God that you keep staying as healthy and active as you are. We really need you. I mean, I became an activist at age 18 when I joined the Gandhian movement and lived in a Gandhian ashram. And I walked with Vinoba Bhave um, for land reform. He was another great teacher. And now I'm 85 and I'm still an activist. And I, my life is devoted to the service of uh, humanity. And, and I enjoy it. And I celebrate. And your word is celebration, very beautiful. So I celebrate it. And I want to remain activist and be in the service of humanity until the last breath of my life. I'm here to serve. And so thank you for your blessing and thank you for your support and thank you for your love and thank you for your friendship. Thank you, Satish. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.